Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this episode of the Summit for Wellness podcast. Are you interested in the keto diet but not quite sure how to get started with it? Well, we have a webinar for you, and we only have a couple webinar times left for you to learn how to get started with the keto diet. So if you go to summitforwellness.com slash keto webinar, we will teach you how to properly prepare your body for the keto diet. That way you aren't like some of these other people that jump into a diet and come down with the keto flu or don't feel good when you're switching over to a different dietary style. We will guide you through that process in a way that will make it as seamless and as easy as possible for your body. That's one of the biggest things that we've been seeing with all these keto programs out there is that no one is teaching you how to properly prepare your body and to go from a normal standard American diet straight into a higher fat ketogenic type diet can be really stressful to the body. So we want to make sure that you are prepared for that transition and we don't want to stress your body out in the process. Okay, in this episode, I have a guest, a fellow gift fellow named Pat Purcell who is going to be coming on to talk all about chronic pain. And I briefly mentioned in the last episode that if you suffer from chronic pain, this is the episode that you have been waiting for because he goes into different strategies and different techniques to be able to figure out ways for you to move in a way that does not hurt your body and to start repairing your body. And we know that there are a lot of other factors than just a physical component of pain that could be part of the problem. So listen in as I talk with Pat Purcell all about chronic pain. Pat Purcell is a physiotherapist based in Ottawa, Canada. He has completed numerous post-grad courses such as the Davis Sullivan Mentorship, online pain management courses through MedBridge, Adrian Lowe's pain management courses, and became a fellow of Applied Functional Science. He specializes with those with chronic pain and trying to lose weight or improve health. Thanks for coming on to the show, Pat. Thanks, Brian. Now, you're coming from a really interesting background where you study pain science, and I haven't had a whole lot of experience talking with people that know a lot of information about pain science. So can you talk about what made you so interested in pain science? Well, sure. I, um, I became a physical therapist. Uh, it, was, it was my second profession, and I, I came to quite be quite interested in it because of a love of sport. I played a lot of sports back in Ireland and I had the usual uh, acute injuries that you suffer. And I got fascinated with uh, treatment processes and that linear progression to getting you back to, to playing again. And when I was studying to be a therapist, of course, one of the areas we studied was chronic pain, but it seemed to be a pretty abstract uh, area it didn't really affect me. And then when I qualified and I started to work in a private clinic, and particularly when I came to Canada, uh, I, I never worked in a, in a hospital setting in Canada. It's always been in the private clinic. Um, more and more chronic pain patients were coming through the door. And it's a very challenging area. Obviously, it's challenging for the patient, but it's challenging for the therapist as well. Because if you take um, uh, the, uh, the, the normal treatment process, you know, a patient comes in, I've got a problem, the therapist tries to help you, there's a nice linear progression, and after X number of visits, you're discharged. And the whole goals and objectives, um, you have to sit down with somebody. You know, if somebody's got uh, chronic pain for uh, five years in their lower back, for example, um, you know, you have to sort of sit down with the patient and say, what, what is it you're looking for? And they're obviously looking for a reduction in their pain. But if you use that normal uh, patient therapist relationship where they're going to come in for 10 visits or 
uh, four months, then at the end of that time, they're, in all likelihood, their pain will not have reduced. And the goals and objectives then have to be managed over a longer period of time. And that's what got me into it, was a feeling of needing to, to know more and to also expand on, on the physical. And there's certainly more to chronic pain than just the physical. And um, I'm sure you'd probably agree as physical therapists, we, we do tend to obviously concentrate on the physical quite a bit. And uh, that's what led me down that path, really. And it was, you know, it's it's quite shocking. Like um, the numbers in, in the US, I'm sure everyone quotes them to you, but they're still pretty shocking. Like 160 million people in the United States have some sort of chronic pain. And it's it's quite staggering. And it it, uh, it doesn't hit the news and it, it probably should be on the news all the time. Uh, added to that, 100 million people in the US are overweight or obese. And I'm not saying that there's a direct correlation between the two, but oftentimes there are because of that um, overweightness or obesity, there is a, a comorbidity that is causing pain. So the, the arthritis, the diabetes, and, and so on. Yeah, and we can talk about what uh, nutrition does for inflammation within the body, which can lead to pain a little bit later. But can you classify what chronic pain is for those that might not know? Well, there, there's various definitions of it, but the, the, the more commonly accepted one is, is, is chronic pain is a state of pain that is lasting for three months or longer. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's a, a systemic um, pain, so a fibromyalgia that could be in multiple uh, sites or if it is a, a, a just one site. And uh, so you could have, you know, I see fibromyalgia patients and they have pain in maybe seven or eight sites or um, somebody who's got a very specific lower back pain. So if someone came into you and they have a very obvious trauma to the body that uh, you can tell why they have this chronic pain, what would be some of the, the treatment options that you might start with first? I, I guess it depends on the age of the trauma. So if you've got uh, a classic uh, trauma that is um, very new and doesn't come under the chronic pain, then um, obviously you go through a more uh, traditional set of, uh, of treatments. But if you've got somebody who say, you know, I, I was in a car accident uh, two years ago and uh, I do have lower back pain or shoulder pain or neck pain, and you know that the recent set of uh, x-rays or MRI or whatever it was are clear, then um, your uh, course of treatment is really based on their history in that previous two years. So oftentimes patients, when they come to see you, you will not be their first therapist. You might be their fifth or sixth. And you try to gauge what the previous therapist attempted with them. What are they doing every day? Uh, are they very sedentary or are they very active? Um, and and that that you try to marry in um, that type of uh, knowledge with a with a treatment plan. And of course, you know, um, looking at movement patterns as well. Uh, so somebody with chronic pain will have a you know uh, specific movement patterns to try and uh, alleviate that pain. And you can discuss with them strategies to try and gradually change that. Um, so it, it it depends on the on that history of the patient. You know what are they doing? Uh, what have they done? What have they tried before? Uh, what are their belief systems as well? Um, and it also depends too, because chronic pain is 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 very destructive for both mind and body, uh, I find that people, um, it's almost like they're going through seven stages of grief, uh, of grief here. So, you know, if somebody's pretty angry about their condition, which they of course have a right to be, then um, uh, they may not be as receptive to some of your treatment options. Whereas if somebody's quite accepting of it, uh, they will be. 
So um, I try to take a, 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 as clear and concise a, a, a patient history as I can. So you mentioned the whole mind and body component that can be part of pain. And we see sometimes that people come in and they are experiencing pain, but when they go through any kind of imaging, like an MRI or anything similar, and there's no actual trauma to the body, yet they are still experiencing pain, what is actually going on there? Well, it's a great question because this is why there's so much research going on at the moment. Like what, what, is, what is the advantage for the body to be still feeling this pain? And unfortunately, the body goes through actual changes. So time is crucial here. And the longer somebody feels pain, the easier it is for them to feel it over time. So that that uh, threshold for depolarization of, of nerves actually becomes a lot smaller. And when you think about um, the the postsynaptic receptors, so the, those those launch pads between uh, nerve endings that that start that nerve impulse, they become really, really responsive. And it becomes a lot easier with a smaller amount of chemical ions to get those guys to respond. And not only that, but you get a, 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 a increased blood flow to the area. It's almost like the body wants to uh, really feed the nerves in, in, that, in that part of the body. But one of the more challenging things that happens is in the central nervous system itself. So you've got these uh, things in the dorsal horn of the um, uh, of, of your spinal cord called interneurons and they're almost like the, uh, the the blocks they help to modulate pain and uh, for acute pain they actually block some of the the, the pain signals uh, so that it doesn't get too high in the presence of chronic pain they actually die so those that pain modulation actually goes. So you've got a system where at the site of pain, um, you've got increased blood flow. And I should point out as well, actually, that um, uh, the nerve endings, so like your chemoreceptors, uh, that that uh, they, they tell us chemicals, mechanoreceptors for pressure, thermoreceptors for cold and heat, they lose their specific jobs and they start to generate pain signals. So at the site, you're getting all these changes and in your spinal cord, you're losing the, the bodyguard to help you modulate your pain. And uh, it, the some of the explanations that they give for why the body might try to do this is that uh, you can always look at the brain as the CEO of a company and say the lower back is is one of the departments of that company and it's not doing too good and it, it's getting all these pain signals well does it want to know more about the pain or does it want to know less and it wants to know more and your pain the appetite for your brain becomes insatiable and it wants to know more and more and more and your movement thresholds go down and the ability for you to feel pain goes up so unfortunately, your body actually changes. And that's one of the reasons why somebody can have a clear test, but still have lots of pain. So if someone had an amputation of some sort, or they lost a limb, and they're receiving that phantom pain, is the nervous system still being affected here? And is that part of the reason why they're still experiencing pain? That's right. Yeah. Um, the, 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 that, that, marries into changes that happen at the at the at the nervous system and the nervous system's um inability to adapt to that new limb um i know that uh one of the treatment options for an, an amputee is to stroke the end of the uh, the site of amputation to try and retrain your nervous system as to the the new uh, dimensions of the body but that's absolutely right, and uh, you, you know, you, the the there's there's actually um, a similarity between phantom limb pain and chronic pain because 
for the phantom limb pain, the limb's not there anymore. And for the chronic pain, the injury's not there anymore. Or, you know, in, 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 in a lot of cases. Yeah, the injured site is missing. Is, is missing, yeah. So as a physiotherapist, a lot of times you're the first in line for treatment of the patients that you see. And a lot of times what we see is if you aren't able to fix the patient's pain, then the next step in the doctor's world is, well, then we have to do surgery. So are there steps that we could start to implement in between that initial stage with the physio and surgery? Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad to say, and I, I know from speaking to some American physical therapists as well, that um, the whole surgeon-therapist uh, relationship is, is changing a bit. And um, certainly for somebody, I think it's fair to say 10, 15 years ago, people would have been operated on a bit more. Whereas now... Um, the, I think there's a realization that it's it's really not it's it's not really serving the patient's interest to necessarily operate um, when there's no clear reason for them to be pain. Um, I know uh, quite a you know I know a few patients that have been turned down for surgery here in Ottawa for that reason. Um, there's a a a growing um, link between the surgical world and the physical therapy world. And I think we try to keep the, the surgeon in, um, in the loop as regards what physical exertion the patient's able to do. But um, in terms of, of uh, the decision to have surgery, um, the, I, I find anyway, the scope of influence for the therapist is, is is not is not that great because it's uh, perhaps uh, outside of our scope of practice. But uh, I certainly have been in discussions with with patients where you know I'm trying to say you know it really probably will not serve you well to go through that surgery. But at the same time, I'm respectful of the fact that I'm not the one feeling the pain, and right. the, uh, and the and the patient is is just simply looking for a solution. On the other end of that spectrum, if someone has gone through a surgery of some sort and then months down the road they're still experiencing pain or it might be referred pain from elsewhere in the body that was manipulated because of compensation that happens after the surgery, what would you do with those type of patients? Well, I, I think that that is a little bit different because then the patient is faced with um, a more clear cut road. So they've gone through the surgery. So obviously there's going to be an element of hope there. Uh, this might be a solution. The sol that hasn't worked out. So that then is when you're sitting down with the patient saying, okay, your course of action now has to be um, uh, a blend uh, of physical um, diet, relaxation, distraction uh, techniques to try and find a, a more longer term solution. I think the I think the problem here is there's a difference between surgery and what we would have to offer, and that big difference is time. Now there are cases when you know somebody has surgery on their back, and because it's a more acute episode, it does help. So you get a, a quite um, a fast change in the patient's symptoms. What we have to offer is longer term. And it's um, one of the things that the patient has to be educated on from the get go. And uh, but because they've already been through the surgery route, um, it's sometimes easier to get them on board because this is unfortunately, the, the, the only option that's available to them. So I'm curious about what you do within your own practice. If someone comes in with a lot of pain, are you in your assessments and your movement patterns trying to find that pain threshold and trying to expand upon it? Or are you trying to find that threshold and then working directly underneath it to try to solidify the movement patterns that they actually do have and then be able to see if you can branch from that point forward? Yeah, I'm doing my best to try and stay underneath it if, if, if I can. 
but it's not it's not the be all and end all of of uh, of, of everything either. It, it does depend on the irritability of symptoms. Um, finding the patient's baseline is huge because uh, unfortunately, oftentimes with chronic pain, you can do a small amount of exercise and then the, their pain spikes and it spikes for um, a long time. So finding that baseline is huge, but introducing um, movement patterns that, so again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning about uh, what, what your goals and objectives are and what you consider to be success. And if you're saying to the patient, you know, this is a long-term, excuse me, a long-term project, um, that, you know, they, they, the first initial uh, movement patterns that you put them through, say they're eight out of 10 on their pain scale. And if they're still eight out of 10 on their pain scale, that's where you would start because you can't expect um, massive changes within within the first couple of weeks. And that's what makes it a challenging area because I know in Canada, people generally have uh, health insurance that might cover $500 physiotherapy or $1,000 of physiotherapy. So it's, it's, um, it's trying to find enough to give the patient to do as a home exercise program trying to find, give them a carrot that will, that will uh, motivate them to do more. Uh, but knowing that it's a long-term project and it is like, I'm seeing people and I'm not seeing people every week. Uh, you know, people can't afford that, but I'm seeing people over a long period of time, you know, the, the element of discharging people pain-free, you know, it's not really, um, it's not really going to happen in the, in the short term. So, um, it, the, the, and then of course your, your initial assessment of the patient can, it can actually take more than one session. So if you've got somebody who, um, you know, has lower back pain, they can't sit down, they can't lie down, then your initial assessment is obviously limited. The next time they come in, they might be able to lie down. So it, it, it depends on your, your baseline might only be achieved after three or four sessions. But the important thing, if somebody is limited and in a lot of pain, that's when the education starts. You know, a lot of people don't have, they go to their doctor and with all due respect to their, their family doctor, they're, they're busy. So they're given pain medication. They go to the surgeon, maybe they don't have a lot of time there either. They might go to Google, but, um, you know, what they read might not be entirely helpful. And uh, one of the most powerful strategies is to educate, educate, educate. And, you know, I often find myself repeating the same things over and over again, because the message, the long-term message has to get through. And unfortunately for chronic pain patients, you know, there's a, there's a real sadness there because their lives are not working out the way they had intended. And I would love, as would every physical therapist, to give a concoction of, th of uh, exercises that would work uh, relatively quickly. But you, you want to educate the patient on the way forward and the strategies that you're going to use. Um, and also, what did the patient love before they had chronic pain? Did they like to run? Did they like to swim? Did they like to walk? What, what was it they loved to do? And how can you incorporate that into your exercise program? Because that's obviously going to be easier to maintain because they love that particular activity. Yeah, you make a really good point about as a physiotherapist, you get more time with your patients than typically doctors do. So you do have that time to give education to them and to start figuring out better programs and protocols for them that'll help them to get through that pain faster. Now, if you're lucky, you can get a couple hours with a patient each week, and if that's the case, then that's a decent amount of time to work with them, but a lot of times you don't get that much time, and that's where, like you said, that home exercise program becomes so powerful. But also, there's uh, other components of their life, too, that they may see you two hours a week, but you don't know their stress levels, you don't know what they're eating, so 
with those type of other lifestyle factors, what does stress do to chronic pain when you're trying to work on somebody and trying to reduce their pain levels? Well, stress is a huge, a huge factor and it, beco- it can become a, um, uh, like a chicken and egg thing. You know, what's causing the stress? Is the pain causing the stress or is the stress causing the pain? Um, but unfortunately, we know that s- stress is a fatiguer. So <clears throat> if somebody's feeling stressed, their, their tone levels go up and that means their body's going to fatigue more quickly than if they're not stressed. And it also, um, you know, to go back to the beginning about uh, um, the the nerve threshold potential being uh, e- more easily activated um, because of the uh, tensile stresses going through the body, that becomes even more so. Um, so stress becomes a you know a huge component, and and that's you know the the patient's history. Um, do they feel stressed when they drive? Do they feel stressed at work? Uh, do they feel stressed at home? And of course, you know, we all have a scope of practice. So we're not trying to delve too much into if somebody has marital problems or work problems, but we're just trying to get a gauge for how work makes them feel or how family life makes them feel. Um, uh, are they trying to work, uh, you know, two jobs with this pain, that type of thing. And that that can become quite wearing on somebody. And uh, oftentimes just, uh, you know, empathizing with the patient on their situation can can be quite effective and allowing them the opportunity to get it across how difficult it is to, you know, to work two jobs and and feel this pain or to be a mother of four and feel this pain. Um, And that's where you know, you pl- I, personally, anyway, I, I start planting the seed and I say, well, okay, stress seems to be an issue with you. I'm not going to say that I'm a, a, an expert on stress reduction. Would you be interested in speaking to somebody who is? And, um, you know, this is where the, the whole management of, of a chronic pain patient becomes uh, a team. And uh, I know in the Ottawa area, I'm familiar with a couple of really good psychologists and some people are a little bit wary of going to one, but they can be really effective in giving people coping strategies uh, for their condition and can actually really help you as a physical therapist in the long run. Um, or if they don't want to go down that road, they might want to see somebody who's um, an expert in meditation, um, uh, yoga techniques. There's a lot of different um uh, ways of, of reducing stress and you try to get them to think as well sometimes because their family doctors will say you know go to a physical therapist go to a physical therapist they become quite um, they think oh this is the only option and uh, I know for a lot of my patients they're like oh wow I didn't even consider going to a psychologist I didn't even consider going to meditation so it gives them uh, almost uh, uh, more hope that there's there's more things that they can try um, and it, it, uh, I, I know for a fact that, uh, uh, a lot of my patients, when they go and speak to somebody who's, uh, expert in stress reduction or coping strategies, they do feel better. And I, I don't mean that they feel less pain, but they feel better. They feel better able to cope and they understand what to do to try and bring their stress levels down. Yeah, and from a functional medicine standpoint, we know that excessive stress can catabolize tissues. So if yeah. someone's trying to go through a repair process and they're just chronically stressed with their chronic pain, then the likelihood of actually being able to repair the tissues is very low because you have to be in more of a relaxed state for that tissue repair to happen. That, that, that's very true. And, and, and oftentimes you'll find uh, sleep is a, is a huge issue. Not, not only because they're in pain, but because they're stressed. And uh, we know that's, that you know, uh, getting somebody with a functional sleep pattern is, is really important from that point of view as well. So we also know that diet can play a role. So if you're trying to repair your tissues and you're eating all this junk food, then you're not getting the nutrients that you need into the tissues to help with the repair process as well. So can you go into how diet affects Uh, chronic pain and what are some strategies that we can use to uh, use diet in a way that's more beneficial to the process? 
Well, when I touch on diet with my patients, uh, I tend to go into extremes. So I, try, I say, you know, can you, can you imagine uh, a situation where, you know, you go to the supermarket and when I immigrated to Canada, uh, I discovered a thing called jujubes. I don't know if you have them in the States. Um, we call them jujubes. Okay. Uh, they're, they're evilly delicious. Uh, but I, I, I say, you know, imagine you just add a bag of those, like a pound of them or something. Imagine how your body would feel after that. Imagine if you got a party pack of chips and you ate those. Um, you know, can you, ima- you, you can see a direct correlation there. The fuel you're putting in is not good fuel. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always quick, again, scope of practice to point out that, you know, I'm, I am a physical therapist, but I'm, you can you can easily see that if you were to live on those foods, it would not be good for you. And equally, it would not be good for you if you're uh, in chronic pain. So, you know, you go back to your stress and, uh, you know, the healing process. Um, you know, obviously, the fuel we put in is hugely important. And I try to say to people, imagine you're not in chronic pain, that your body is absolutely fine and you eat certain foods, your body gives off inflammatory markers. And those inflammatory markers are going around your body, even though you feel fine. And I say that's happening to everybody every day because we all have our foods that we we like that are not good for us. And if you're in chronic pain, when you then eat those same food and your body gives off those inflammatory markers that make it easier for you to feel pain, um, you can see that it certainly doesn't help. How many times do you say, and I I, I use um, some conditions as well that they might be familiar with. So gout is one. So you see people, they, they get this severe pain in their big toe because there's actually crystals there that are deposited there from what they've just eaten. Um, And again, not saying your pain is going to go away, but your ability to cope with it is bound to improve if you're eating better. Um, There's also the, the, uh, the issue of energy. So some of the foods that are not particularly good for us, boom and bust, you know, you eat something with a high glycemic index, you, you feel good for half an hour and suddenly you crash. You know, if you can have a more moderated diet where you're not hungry. And I always say to people, you know, do you feel hungry an hour after you eat? Do you feel hungry half an hour after you eat? If you do, then there's something wrong because you shouldn't be hungry an hour after you eat. You should be hungry four hours after you eat or five even. And uh, it, it goes about, it's all about the quality of food. And um, some some of my patients say, well, you know, it's expensive to buy that food. And, uh, you know, the most obvious one is uh, vegetables. And I say, well, you know, I can't afford organic. Fair enough. Can you do uh, fresh? No, I can't do that either. Fair enough. Can you do canned? So there's all there's always there's always like a, a some sort of an option there. And I some of my patients are eating canned vegetables, and we're 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 trying that. It's not ideal. But it's better than, um, you know, large amounts of fast food. And I, I think we'd all love to eat some of the, the, the more tastier stuff. But it, it just uh, for the long term benefits. And again, chronic pain is such a long term thing. I always ask, I ask my patients, you know, where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in ten years? And diet is a huge part of that. Yeah, and you make a good point about the cost of food right now. It could very well be expensive, even though there are a lot of cheaper options that are available, but it might be expensive to get full organic. But if you eat poor foods, then 10 years down the road when you develop other diseases or issues Mm -hmm. because of the poor food choices, that's a a lot more expensive than the food that you could have bought in in the process. Yeah, and and unfortunately... um uh, I, I remember listening to a guy on the radio and he was talking about the brain being probably one of the biggest enemies to you because it's only interested in the here and now. So if somebody says to you, you know, think about five years from now, think about 10 years from now, your brain's not really interested in that. It's just interested in satisfying its needs at the moment. And sometimes 
the needs at the moment are not good. And if you continue with that, as you say, five or 10 years down the line, you will um, perhaps suffer, uh, uh, develop uh, some other uh, health issues that are directly related to your um, your uh, diet uh, choices. Yeah, and we see that happen within the body in a lot of different ways. If you get injured, then you develop uh, compensations that go away from that injury so that you're not experiencing that pain, but those compensations might hurt you later on down the road. But like you said, the body is only worried about right now. It wants you to survive this exact moment. It doesn't care about five years down the road. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's amazing. Um, uh, it, it, it doesn't take a huge change to people's diet. I'm not saying that people are eating fast food all the time or eating junk food all the time. Not, not at all. But there's, there's, there's always something that you can hone in on. on you know, a, a lot of times uh, chronic pain people are interested in foods that provide stimulus. So because they're not getting enough sleep, they drink a lot of coffee or, or pop. Um, because they feel tired all the time, they eat sugary foods. And then you get down a, a, a route where they're perhaps um, putting on extra weight and of course, you know, things can snowball a little bit. And it's about saying to, you know, you can get the energy you require from other forms of food. And um, it, oftentimes it's just a, a simple reduction in carbs. I'm not saying, you know, and this is another thing too, Brian, about diet. Um, unfortunately for people, of course, you can go online and look up all these dietary experts and they all contradict each other. So one will say no carbs. Another will say only brown carbs. So brown rice or brown millet or uh, cashew or whatever the uh, buckwheat, whatever the case may be. And somebody else will will say something different or just protein or whatever the case. But I do, I have sort of come to the conclusion that uh, a reduction in carbs and replacing that then with uh with vegetables, for example, is, is, is really useful. And you're just trying, again, it goes back to time. It's going to be a long, long time. And it's going to be uh, something that has to be gauged over a period of time. But I say to the patient, is it not worth trying? No, definitely. Right. And they, they could just make small changes along the way too. They don't need to shift completely into a new diet overnight. Absolutely. They can, they can take out the box of cheese. It's, that you eat every day and just have one every couple of days. And that's better than what they were doing. Totally. And uh, you make a really good point. If you make wholesale changes, you're less likely to keep them. And um, if you make wholesale changes too, uh, what tends to happen is that family members notice that and they go, oh, well, why, why don't you have a couple of Oreos? It's not going to kill you. And you fall back into the the trap again. And I'm not saying, of course, we all love Oreos. I'm just using it as an example that if you make too many changes, um, people notice and it it might not be always uh, uh, supportive. So, yeah, little and often uh, to the or little little changes here and there can go a long way. So then another thing that we find with a lot of people in chronic pain is they steer away from any kind of exercise, which, as you mentioned earlier, with a lot of weight gain, whether that's from diet or lack of exercise or both, then that could cause issues as well. So obviously everybody's different and their bodies are different, but how can you start incorporating different exercises into people's routine to uh, help just get them moving, but also to help with the chronic pain issues they may be facing. Well, again, I uh, to go back to the diet, when I say, where do you see yourself in five years? I tend to ask that question for movement too. So lower back pain, it hurts when I bend forward. Um, so I just, I just don't bend forward. And I say, well, you know, imagine in five years, you never bend forward ever again. How is your, how is your back going to be? Is it going to be is he going to be able to cope more with that action or less? And the patient can say, yeah, I can see that it would be less able to cope. So um, one, I have to say, um, 
you know, for people who don't know, don't know, we're both uh, fellows from the Gray Institute. And I did um, the fellowship with the Gray Institute last year. And it's been hugely helpful for me with chronic pain patients because some of the 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 tenants of that course one of them start with success um it, it's such a simple rule but it can be huge and again say lower back pain it hurts when i do this particular action okay your body is a is a total unit does it hurt if you uh, move your shoulders? No. Does it hurt if you move your neck? No. Does it hurt if you move your thoracic spine? Not so much. If so, I can twist my thoracic spine. That doesn't hurt my 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 lower back so much. Does it hurt if you move your hip? No. It hurts if I move my hip into extension behind me, but it doesn't hurt if I move forward. Gotcha. And and so on and so on. So you're just taking a note of. Um, a movement patterns, of course, but you're taking note of what works and what doesn't. And the goal is obviously to get to a stage where they can tolerate um, something that they can't at this moment in time. But it allows you to start with success, maybe at the opposite end of the movement. So if flex, if bending forward hurts, maybe you want to start with the opposite and, and move from there. And um, again, time being an issue, it's going to take it's going to take some time. I know you want to get your pain down, but this is going to take some time. So there's no rush. You don't have to rush into that uh, really painful uh, position. And with all the information that we learned from the Gray Institute, we know that we can move someone a million different ways. And there's yep. got to be something within that million <clears throat> different ways that they're able to do. So. Totally. And, and, you know, it's really interesting because I often think about when I was training as a physical therapist and, you know, you'd see as a student, you'd overhear therapists saying, oh, my patient said it hurts when I cut the grass. So I told them not to do it. And it, 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 it gets it, you sort of say to the patient, you know, movement is not wrong. We're just trying to find the best way for you to do it. So you're absolutely right. Like you can bend forward in so many different ways, or you can uh, trick your body into thinking it's 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 not moving when it actually is. A classic example would be for somebody with uh, chronic neck pain. So it hurts when I look left and right. Oh, well, okay, look straight in front and just twist your trunk instead. And you'd be amazed at the amount of times that doesn't hurt people as much. And um, you just keep looking for the little glimpses of hope that uh, are there. It doesn't matter how bad someone's pain is when they come into the clinic. They can do something well. They can do something well. They can do something that doesn't spike their pain and you build from there. And with that example of the neck pain, the more someone does something that hurts, the more it creates that neuroplasticity within their brain that tells them that this certain way that I look hurts really bad and therefore I can't do it. But just like you said, you can tell them to keep their head straight and then move their trunk and it might not hurt. And that's because they don't perceive it as, oh, my head's going the same direction by doing this as it would if I just look to the left. Uh, so. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, and it's uh, it's it's so true, and and it it's it's really lovely to see um, when a patient has a eureka moment when they they think, oh my god, I I didn't think I could do that, and um, uh, it's it's lovely to see because they're they're just fearful of of course so many movements, and um, it's great it's great to see it, and and like I said. Like you said, sorry, um, one of the things about the Gray Institute is, you know, you have so many different possible ways to move. And uh, I don't, uh, obviously, I'm respectful of the fact they're in pain. So I'm not going to keep them moving for uh, a long time as I'm assessing them. But I certainly will try some pretty basic gross movements to see what happens. And uh, um, tweaking it along the way is 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 a fundamental part of that you know you can you can make some huge gains with somebody um uh you know 
again, just to use uh, the lower back, uh, it hurts when I bend over. Okay, well, what happens if your right foot is in front and then you bend over? Oh, it doesn't hurt as much. And the person is like, oh, my God, I, I, I didn't think I could bend over that much with only a little increase in pain rather than this huge spiking pain. So the, there's, there's always a moving pattern that you can start with. Right. And that's that's uh, really good for all the physical therapists or anybody that's working with people with patients in the movement realm or working with people with chronic pain to know that there is always a place where you can start. Uh, yeah, always. I mean, if if our if our bias, which of course it is as physical therapists is for movement, um, you know, we the body will will give us clues. It will give us clues along the way. And uh, we're, we're just detectives and we're just trying to find what they are. And again, you know, for the patient to move and for it to be relatively OK is huge. And they will go home with that exercise. They will go home and they will. If you have a chronic pain patient and you try something in the clinic and it doesn't hurt them that much, I guarantee you they will comply with that exercise because they're they're so unused to moving without uh, spikes in pain. Um, so you like I I rarely 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 get people who don't comply with something that doesn't hurt them in the clinic. Well, this has been re uh, really great information, Pat. I'm so glad that we talked about chronic pain. Is there any last words you want to give about chronic pain for those that may be suffering from it? Well, like I, like I always say to people, if you're listening to this and you're suffering from chronic pain, the first thing I would say is I'm sorry you're suffering from it. And it is unfair. And the, there's no doubt about that, that it is unfair. And uh, your life is now not what you thought it would be. And the, the only thing is there's more to it than physical therapy. There's more to it than psychology. There's more to it than meditation. Um, there's lots of different things that you can do. It doesn't have to be just painkillers. And, uh, you know, it, it's about thinking of the long term and going with that. And that there's always a better way of doing things. And you also have your own podcast. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, it's uh, threewaypath.com and uh it's 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 a chronic pain and um, uh, a lifestyle uh, podcast. So I'm not just going to be talking about chronic pain. I'm going to be talking about uh, obesity, um, and it's it's absolutely crucial to say that uh, this is not you know in any way slamming people who are overweight. Uh, people should have a pride in their appearance, and I'm fully supportive of that. It's just a, a way to recognize that sometimes because of that, there can be some uh, additional health issues. And it's it's um, just to remind people that a one dimensional solution doesn't exist. You know, purely diet, purely exercise, purely whatever. It's got to be a combination. And if your if your uh, mind is not right, your body won't respond. If your body's not right, your mind won't respond. So it has to be all inclusive. And um, it's, it's, it's trying to remind people of that. And where else can people find you online? Do you have social media channels or anything else? Well, it's a pretty new company. So I'm, I'm still in the process of, uh, of, um, of, of doing that. Uh, but I hope to set that up in the next uh, two to three weeks. Awesome. And we'll have links to your podcast and to your social media channels once you get those up and running all in the show notes. Thanks, Pat, so much for coming on. Thanks, Brian. I just want to say that if you do suffer from chronic pain and you've gone to a bunch of different therapists and tried to find ways to improve your pain but haven't had any success, there is someone out there that can help you. You just got to keep looking and 
eventually you will find the right person. I may be a little biased, but I would highly recommend looking into someone that has gone through the training from the Gray Institute. So if you go to grayinstitute.com and look up the fellow locator, then you can find someone in your area that can help you. There have been tons and tons of cases of people that have gone to 20 plus different practitioners trying to get help and then they find a gift fellow and the gift fellow is able to get them out of pain relatively quickly. So please keep trying, don't give up, and keep pushing forward. Now if you like this episode, please go to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. They do help us to get out in front of more people. So if you go to summitforwellness.com slash iTunes, that will take you right to the page to leave a rating and review, and it would really help us out. And we will see you next time.